Today I'm going to cover one topic. Usually I cover several, so this will be a little different. Um, I'm covering the, a, a, an interview that was done with James Conner from Bloor Street Capital in Toronto, interviews Mark Faber. Mark Faber is an economist. He lives, he's from Europe, but he now lives in Thailand and um, operates, I think, exclusively from his home in Thailand and uh, is sought after quite a bit. Um, and this is an interview that Connor does with Faber. Um, and I'll play clips from it and I'll have some comments on each of those clips. Hi, I'm Ben Repond. Welcome to my YouTube broadcast. Today is September 3rd, 2024. Thank you for watching. Um, I'll get into this. As I said, uh, Mark Faber is in his 70s. I think he's in his late 70s. He graduated from the uh, University of Zurich in Switzerland with a PhD in economics and has spent a lifetime uh, in the equity markets in both Europe and in the U.S. and uh, now lives in Thailand. So you'll see his setup there. And he is a publisher of a uh, newsletter or blog uh, called the Gloom, Doom, Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. So he is known for being a contrarian, for being a naysayer, for being negative, um, and whatever you want to say positive about the market, he'll say something negative. So people view him from that perspective. Uh, I've watched him for a long time. I, I don't know if he is negative or not, uh, but I would say this. I think he is a realist. I think he would say that about himself. He's a realist. And when it's time to be negative about the market, uh, he will be negative. I think there will come a time when it's time to be positive about what's going to happen in the market. We'll find out if he's positive or not. I'm not saying he will be. I think he might. Uh, but see, the problem is that we have in the U.S. and we have really in the world of equity markets, we have people who are making money off of the markets. And I do that as well. And the traditional approach is to tell investors that the market is going up and up and up. And if they issue... Uh, some concern about, well, boy, I think there's a lot of risk out there. The markets are starting to go down. And then when the markets really do go down a lot, they say, no, stay put, stay put. It'll eventually go back up. So whatever you say, they're going to give a positive spin to it that, uh, no, it's okay. It's going up. And so when you have people who like Mark Faber, who are realists or naysayers, uh, that says, okay, th this is not going to the moon. It's not going to end well. The market is going to uh, collapse at some point. The market always goes through cycles and the economy goes through cycles. Way up and then it crashes. Goes way up and then it crashes and so forth. And over time, it has gone up through all of that. But what hurts people and scares people is these periods when it goes way down where people lose, let's just say, 50% of their money. This has happened many times. 30, 40, 50% or more of their money, and it shakes people, particularly if they are in retirement or approaching retirement, and they just don't have the stamina or the stomach to handle those kinds of crashes. So, there are people like Mark Faber who, uh, and there's others, I've played them, and that say we are in a period of extreme highs and that what follows this typically is a crash. Well, the, what none of us know, including Mark Faber, we don't know when, and he is very careful to not say when. And some people do. Uh, I try to stay away from that. But when you see the level of extended highs that we have right now, 
and the cycles that the market has gone through over in the U.S. has gone through for a couple of hundred years, uh, you can see that at some point uh, it will crash. We're on borrowed time, in my opinion. So uh, anyway, he gives a perspective. You can view it as negative if you want or view him as negative if you want. Um, but it's a view that I think is, to me, seems like it's a realistic view. Now, I want to put, to put this in perspective, I want to make a couple of comments. One, it is a macro view. So don't think that what he's saying is going to happen tomorrow or even this year. Uh, and the economy, and he does go back and forth between the economy and the stock market, uh, the economy is not the stock market, and the stock market is not the economy. They, they can behave very differently, and oftentimes do. Um, and, of course, he is a contrarian. So there are other contrarians. Uh, you know, I've mentioned um, uh, Seth Klarman and Warren Buffett and uh, Stanley Druckenmiller. These are uh, probably... Um, John Paulson. These are people who are um, very sophisticated and very successful investors that manage money for other people. Uh, you could say uh, this. You could say the same thing about Jim Rogers. Jim Rogers does not manage money for other people. He used to, but he doesn't now. But he's also a contrarian. So these are among the most historically among the most successful uh, investors or investment managers in the U.S. Everyone I named is a contrarian. So Mark Faber is also a contrarian. So you could, you could easily put him in the Warren Buffett camp if you wanted. He, would, he and Warren Buffett, from an investing perspective, would probably think very similarly. Um, but because he is very out front about it, or upfront about it, uh, he looks like more of a negative person. But when you look at Warren Buffett's actual, what he actually does, it's quite contrarian oriented. Okay, so I'm gonna play a series of clips that will give you some perspective. They're a little different view. Um, the first one is about government reporting. Uh, this has to do with inflation data. A lot of this has to do, you hear him say real dollars or real wages. What that means, and he'll say it oftentimes, inflation adjusted. So inflation matters. So the government reports inflation. They report it through the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. And the, but they are under-reporting, and people know this, they even admit that they do it, uh, that the government is under-reporting uh, inflation data. Um, what, what the reality of this is that because of the way they report it, it makes the economy and the gross domestic product from the economy look like it's doing well and because they're re over reporting the uh, um, or excuse me they're under reporting the results and making it look like the economy is doing better than it is um, and so that he he deals with that issue on this first clip so take a listen so why don't we dive into that in a little more detail and this is why i always enjoy speaking to you because of your contrarian approach and as you just alluded to that, there is so much money in the U.S. and in the U.S. financial markets right now. And I want to get your opinion on that. And before we discuss the financial markets, I first want to discuss the U.S. economy. And we saw a very strong Q2 GDP number came out at 2.8%, much higher than was, was expected, much higher than Q1, which was only 1.6%. But what's your take on this Q2 numbers? The U.S. economy heating up again, or is it as strong as we think it is, or maybe weaker, or was this number a fake number? I mean, what fascinates me about the investment industry and the financial markets is that uh, financial people in general, the economists who work for Wall Street firms and so forth, with very few exceptions, they rely on statistics that are published by the government. Now, I have sources uh, that would indicate that inflation, and this is not just one source and one kind of mysterious economist in the background, 
but numerous sources indicate that inflation over the last 30, 40 years has been much higher than what the government is saying it has been. And so if you take nominal GDP figures and you say the GDP grew at 3% or 2.5% and inflation was 3 or 4%, instead of what the government is calculating at one and a half or two percent, then suddenly in real terms, GDP is down. And I can tell you that the majority of Americans, say the median household in America is struggling. We have this from all sorts of companies that sell retail goods to people and services that Consumers are not as strong as they used to be. They're struggling even to pay their grocery bills. Over 70% of U.S. households depend on paycheck to paycheck to, check to pay their bills. If someone tells me the economy is strong, then he believes in nonsense. The economy is not strong. And if you measure the GDP is a meaningless figure. What matters is the standard of living of people. Are they better off than 10 years ago or are they worse off? And I can tell you in the whole of Europe and the United States, the typical household is not as well off and earns less than his parents used to earn in real terms, inflation adjusted. So in the same vein, the, um, this next clip, uh, Mark Faber is going to talk about the impact of printed money. Now, of course, when I say printed money, it's not printed. Uh, we use that term because it used to be the printing of money. Now it's digital. So more digital money is coming into the system. And what that does is it pushes down the buying power of the dollar. In other words, you need more and more dollars to buy the same amount of goods and services. And if you apply that over a long period of time, which has been the case for over 100 years, the, uh, the, the difference between uh, nominal dollars and real dollars, in other words, the dollars that you see reported versus the ones that are inflation adjusted, there's quite a bit of difference. So this does matter. And um, wages are not keeping up with prices. Now, you know this because you live in the world of real wages and you go and shop and you buy groceries and pay your bills and so forth. So you know that the prices are elevated, but that the wages, your, your source of income, is not keeping up with that. Um, and then he says money printing is, the, is a tax on the ordinary person. And of course, it is. It's not an official tax, but it is a tax. So take a listen to this piece. But, but I want to make one thing very clear. The Fed and American economies look at inflation as an increase in the cost of living, say, uh, grocery bills and consumer goods and services and so forth. But I look at inflation also at the increase in the, in the value of assets. So I distinguish between consumer good inflation and asset inflation. When consumer goods go up, all the housewives, they complain. When the prices of homes and stocks and bonds and collectibles and baseball cars, <laughs> like the recent one, <laughs> like the memorabilia of Babe Ruth was sold recently, a t-shirt for 23 or 26 million. That is also inflation. But the Fed closes its eyes because it's an inconvenient inflation uh, which is not obviously visible. So that they don't count in. But the true inflation is actually an increase in the quantity of money and credit. That is inflation. And then you have all the symptoms. Commodities go up, stocks go up. Last year, the price of cocoa went up. This year, the price of co the coffee is up 37%. But then they, they make adjustments to the weighting of things. You know, I mean, in the CPI, the Fed calculates that in the last few years, healthcare costs have come down. What a joke. 
Everybody can see that the cost of healthcare is up meaningfully. Everybody can see that, except the academics at the Federal Reserve. So, next piece I want to play, he comments that inflation is hurting, real inflation is hurting the average person. Uh, and then he explains how this is going to work when asset prices collapse 50 percent. And, and he believes, and I share his opinion, that asset prices will collapse in the range of 50 percent or more. And we've seen it before, and then it, it happened for decades before you and I even started looking at it. Uh, it's happened four times in the last, uh, let's see, about the last 50 years, it's happened four times. And it will happen again if you believe in cycles, in economic cycles. When I say asset prices, I'm referring to real estate, stock market, maybe even commodities. Um, sometimes commodities follow that and sometimes they don't. But it's an interesting approach. He, he, he talks about that if, if your asset prices, wherever you have your money invested, if your asset prices drop 20% in nominal terms and the market or the real estate market or the stock market or bond market, they drop 50%, you actually are a winner because your assets are relative to the economy. So you're actually in real terms, in adjusted terms, your assets actually go up in value if the market drops greater than yours. Interesting approach. So take a listen. So the cost of living far exceeds what we're being paid right now. And this is one of the things that's really hurting everybody is that the prices of goods is going up, right. but our wages are basically the same. When I look at my own personal scenario, I'm making the same that I did 20 years ago, right? And so the purchasing value of my dollars is significantly less, but for somebody who's in their 20s or 30s, what would you suggest to them? How do they survive this current economic environment, especially when it comes to affordability because they can't afford to buy a home? A bank recently made a survey and the clients of the banks are investors. They expect, listen to this, returns of 15% per annum inflation adjusted over the next 10 years. 15% per annum. The Dow Jones over the last 100 years has returned something like, I I don't know, 5% per annum inflation adjusted. You understand? The expectations of investors, especially young investors, is completely unrealistic. Completely unrealistic. I think people should sit down and consider the possibility based on the following. We had for the last 40 years, since 1981 for bonds and stocks, since 1982, August 82, when the Dow Jones was below 800, we had a huge bull market in stocks and in bonds and in real estate and in everything. This asset inflation, which is especially pronounced in, say, uh, art prices and in collectibles and also in cryptocurrencies and so forth, this whole asset bubble may deflate. That is a possibility that big investors should entertain. And if it deflates, the thinking should be, everything drops 50%. How do I only drop 20%? Because if, you, if everybody loses 50% and you only lose 20%, you're like the king <laughs> because you lose less than the other. So, in real terms, your wealth increases. Okay, he continues on with this theme of inflation. And he says, you know, real wages, of course, have not kept up with inflation. But what's also interesting, he, he says over a period of about 40 years, that uh, 
our, um, say from our parents, uh, when they were uh, 40 years ago, uh, we are making less than our parents made. And you may think, oh, I know what my father made or my mother made, how much money their income was, and I have a pretty good idea on mine. And my income is quite a bit higher than that, and you may say the same thing. But when you adjusted for inflation, he says, over that period of time, wages have not kept up and are actually lower than they were 40 years ago. He does a, um, I forget, I'm sorry, I forget if it's in this clip or a previous one, but he says that the stock market from 1966 to 1982, so that's a period of, what is that, 16 years, uh, that in that period of time, the stock market in 1982 was about the same place it was in 1966. Over that period of time, it went up and down, but it was about the same place. But when you adjusted for inflation, the market went down 70%, seven zero. So this is why inflation matters, inflation adjusted prices matter, inflation adjusted wages matter. So. Take a listen to this. 60% of Americans are less well off than their parents were 30, 40 years ago. And the last few years have been disastrous. The Fed will tell you, oh, no, we've beaten inflation. Nonsense. The cost of living today is approximately 30% higher than in 2018. That hasn't come down. I agree that right now prices are going up at a lower rate than before. But the prices haven't come down. The home prices are still high. And you pointed out, talked about home prices. The result of high home prices is that most Americans can't afford to buy them. That is the problem. They can't even afford to buy the groceries. Even I had to cut down on the consumption of beer and cigarettes. <laughs> and finally, he talks about the Fed, and he's being asked questions by the host. Uh, and he talks about the Fed and says that the Fed is, and he's very um, direct about it. He says the Fed is all about protecting their friends on Wall Street. And believe me, Jerome Powell and the members of the Federal Open Market Committee um, in the Fed, they definitely have friends on Wall Street. And what they do is protect those people, not the average person. You and I know that sort of intuitively. We know that the guys on Wall Street are getting protected. But you know, Merck Faber has more insight, more access to that information. So it doesn't surprise me when he says something like this. Take a listen. But the Fed, one quality they have, they will always protect their friends on Wall Street. That you can bet upon. What the single uh, worker does in the factory in middle America, they don't give a SHIT about that. You can be sure. So that's enough on Mark Fopper. I Hopefully you gained something from this. Uh, and he's very direct. He uh, has a particular point of view. It's a contrarian point of view. And um, if you are not a contrarian, uh, this is you know a counterpoint to what you believe. If you are a contrarian, he's probably saying something that you quite a bit believe in. OK, the next thing I want to cover, and this is the last thing I'm going to say is I, I saw this, it's one minute, I think it's one minute, is a, um, a reel that my daughter sent me from on Instagram, and it is, uh, it rang home, not about investing, not about the economy. Our family is traveling from different locations. We did this last year for the first time. We're coming from different locations in the US and now from even abroad. Uh, and we're meeting at Thanksgiving, 
for a family get together. You could call it a reunion or whatever. It's just our family. Um, I have six kids, so they come from you know different directions. And so this time we're meeting in Canada, and uh, in uh, well Alberta, I guess. And so we um, so there's this clip. I'm going to play it where the U.S. government, not the Canadian government, the U.S. government is actually requiring a lot of documentation, vaccines, which are fine, uh, microchips, paperwork, approval for this and that, a stack of things, and she goes through them, uh, to get your dog back into the U.S. So if you're in Canada or you're Canadian or you're U.S., whatever, and you're coming across the border, you've got your pet with you, and there are four of us, four members of our family that have dogs that are bringing their dogs, and um, they're not going to be able to get back in the U.S. unless they have all of this documentation. And so there's getting there's a lot of pushback on it. I didn't know about it until I saw this reel, and uh, it, it all it did was just say, you know, I don't know if this matters to you or not, but the 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 takeaway I had on it was that the governments, U.S. government in this case, but it could be Canadian, it could be the U.K., it could be some country in Europe or whatever, they more and more they are becoming, not all maybe, but most of them are becoming very oppressive, uh, tyrannical uh, governments. And I mean, even the Minister of Health in Canada said, we've got, we got better things to do than to mess with this. But yet they mess with it. So they're not happy in Canada about it. But the um, anyway, it's just a, a statement about the world that we live in, that there are governments that are that oppressive, that they will impose that level of regulation. Some of it's just overreaching, in my opinion. Um, if you think the government's doing a good job of trying to police uh, animals in this way or that, okay, that's fine. I, I think that, you know, rabies vaccine and so forth, I think that's totally appropriate. But um, some of the rest of it, just the amount of paperwork, in my opinion, is ridiculous. So um, take a listen, <laughs> and uh, hopefully it doesn't offend you. But uh, so that's it will impact dog owners on both sides of the border because we're talking about Canadian owned dogs, but also Americans who come to Canada with their dogs and then have to return home are also subject to these new rules. They were announced in May. You can't bring a dog across the border into the U.S. that's less than six months of age. The dogs have to be microchipped and the original rules uh, include a specific type of microchip. The dogs have to have a certification of health, mo mostly to do with rabies, of course, uh, by a vet within 30 days of travel to the U.S. There also was to be a certification of that validation from the vet by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the CFIA. Uh, an official was meant to sign off as well on that. And then there was a specific form from the Centers for Disease Control in the States uh, that people had to fill out and bring to the border with them and their dog. And all of this to be in place August 1st. This blindsided uh, the Canadian government, health officials here, uh, CFIA officials, veterinarians and certainly dog owners. Uh, Health Minister Mark Holland uh, said it doesn't make sense. I don't think this is a good use of border officers' time. So there's a lot of issues at the border. Whether or not my Maltese is another Maltese and having a border officer figure that out, I've said to the secretary, doesn't make sense to me. Secondly, uh, we're all for proof of vaccination. Every dog in Canada should be vaccinated against rabies, but having these forms uh, done by veterinarians in Canada is going to take a lot of time to get that validated, uh, as well as making sure all dogs uh, have this chip. It's going to cost a lot of money. He's asking for a complete exemption for Canada, uh, but he said in his conversations with his U.S. counterpart, they did get some things, but not all the things they were looking for. So um, he uh, got a grace period, which means the, the August 1st deadline is a bit 
uh, more fluid in that uh, if people for a couple months uh, will get off with a warning at the border if they don't have all this new paperwork in place. Um, and as well uh, that there's no longer requirement for the CFIA to provide this validation, but you will still need to get certification from your veterinarian and you still have to make sure that your dog is uh, microchipped with an ISO compliant microchip. So that's not an exemption. Okay, thank you for watching. If you have questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. I'm totally open to your thoughts about the uh, Canadian dog question and, and or, you know, the U.S.-Canadian border issue on dogs. And, the, and, of course, anything you want to say about Mark Faber or his comments, I welcome your comments.